the uh, I mean one gets you know I mean credit's not what it's all about and what it's all about is that you've actually made some difference while you're here on this earth and and you know the rest doesn't really matter I mean most people don't ever get a chance to do that so you know I feel lucky about that but you know what happened was of course I'd been taking care of vulnerable populations my whole career and I've been at it more than 40 years so but what happened uh, you know was that of course I knew a little bit about silver diamond florida from from Japan because I'd had colleagues who'd worked in Japan and, and had visited Japan and and so there were you know there were opportunities like that but but truly what happened was that a colleague um, a couple of colleagues from Hong Kong Dr. Chu and Dr. Lo submitted a clinical trial paper describing their first studies with children and they submitted it to the Journal of Dental Research and what was interesting and I ended up being a reviewer and I didn't know them and 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 didn't know their work I'd been to the University of Hong Kong and I knew a little bit about it um, but I but I had no sense that they were doing this and I didn't like the paper the way it was written and actually sent back a lot of really detailed comments and the the major comment I had was the original paper only had information about Carrie's arrest in it didn't have anything about the rest of the mouth and I said well you know this is a, a biological approach this is not a person level approach this is a tooth level approach typical you know uh, people in dentistry that only look at teeth and don't look at people and so I sent back a, uh, a long and very detailed review and I didn't know if I'd ever see the paper again or or what they would do because I didn't know them well they ended up doing a really really good job of revising this paper and sent it back this time with all this data that showed that if you put it on the front teeth that were decayed it protected all the other teeth now that well now all of a sudden we're talking about something that's important here because it didn't surprise me that you could put silver fluoride on teeth and have it have the caries arrest I mean we knew we knew that you could put silver nitrate on teeth and the caries would probably arrest and and you know even at that point we probably knew that you could put glass ionomer on that was you know the beginnings of uh, a traumatic restorative care so so there was plenty of evidence and, and in fact if you go back to the uh, original sealant studies even in, I would say early 60s late 50s um, there was a researcher whose name was Met Fairhurst who was at Alabama and they were sealing in caries so to speak uh, using uh, pit and fissure sealants and essentially using filling material without drilling and you know they would go back and they would look at that the lesions afterwards and sample them microbiologically and of course they found out that they were largely arrested so that wasn't so exciting to me that you could arrest the lesions um, but the fact that you could have a, a beneficial effect on the whole mouth by treating the lesions that that excited me a lot more and of course in my usual way I started smuggling the stuff in and I used it for 10 years before you know before um, we got to the stage where we were at the FDA um, and and you know the second sort of sentinel moment was I was sent a patient uh, who had just had part of his tongue resected and have, had had radiation to his face so he had dry mouth he had he was one year post treatment and he had been sent to his dentist and this was appalling to me because the molars in the radiation area were bombed and needed to be extracted and he had cervical caries in every tooth in his mouth and my job was to sedate him because he was afraid of the dentist I was supposed to sedate him I was supposed to take out the bad teeth and I was supposed to treat the caries and I'm thinking about and I'm not a bad dentist I've got some skills but he had cervical caries in every tooth in his mouth this was not you know and, and 
and he wasn't a rich man. You know, so there wasn't like you were going to do endo on every one of those teeth and put crowns on them all. I mean, you know, some sort of sixty hundred thousand dollar kind of e. Plus, he didn't want you to do that. He was afraid of the dentist. And I and I I went back to the oncology surgeon and I said, well, what am I supposed to do about these molars? You know, and so, so the standard in the care of the United States is that you're supposed to go get barometric oxygen. 20 dives before you have the teeth taken out and 10 dives afterwards. My patient said to me, well, I'm two and a half hours from the nearest barometric oxygen facility. My insurance doesn't cover it. And I can't afford to be away from work because I need to support my family. So I went back to the surgeon. He said, well, just try to get primary closure. It was terrible. So I, you know, closed him up as best I could. He got radio osteonecrosis. Nearly lost his jaw, nearly ended up with a graft, although they finally stopped him. Um, I treated all of his teeth with silver diamond fluoride. And I've seen him for every oncology recall he's had since then. It's about five years at least. And he's never had a filling. Those teeth don't look good on x-rays. They look terrible. <laughs> you can imagine. But, but he's never had another another carious lesion. And his oral hygiene is actually impeccable. And he uses chlorhexidine and he uses xylitol gum and he's gotten a little bit of recovery on his salivary glands. But I asked him the last time I saw him, he said, do you want me to put fillings in your teeth? He said, no. I said, doesn't it bother you how they look? And he said, well, no, actually, I'm quite glad to be alive and, and <laughs> you know, you solved my problem for me. And, and his... You know, one of the interesting side effects of the silver diamond fluoride is that his his gingiva is really healthy. Um, the antimicrobial effects of the silver are obviously very broad spectrum. They don't just affect tooth decay bacteria. So I mean, it was something that we noticed when we started doing the studies for the FDA, that patients that we would be treating for dentin hypersensitivity would have healthy looking gums around their teeth. And, um, you know, so here's this this patient who, you know, otherwise would have lost all his teeth. It wouldn't have been long. Um, and, and he still has all his teeth, or virtually all of them. And, you know, so that's pretty strong stuff, I think, for somebody who cares about patients. And sort of like some motivation to do something about all of this. And then, you know, the, the part of the story, of course, that, that Mike Shercliffe tells is that he and I, were introduced and and I was talking about some of these kinds of things and he said this big gruff guy you know right wing Republican says to me the liberal right he says to me I like what you said <laughs> and uh, but he, you know he sort of said to me what's it gonna take because here you are smuggling this stuff into the United States and I had smuggled florid varnish into the United States uh, from 1980 until 1995 when it was approved. And I had used it in my clinic. So I had years and years of experience using it before anybody in the United States. And, and when it became available in Canada, also before the United States, I used to go up to British Columbia and, and, and bring it across the border. You couldn't send it. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of my favorite stories is of course that when you go across the border from British Columbia to Washington, they ask you if you have any apples or any cherries. I've never once been asked if I had any fluoride varnish. <laughs> and the silver fluoride used to come in a, in a, in a sort of a, a plain brown box, you know, and, and it would either say a baby gift or, or it would be declared as research material or something that Japanese and I kind of got good at, at, at figuring out what to put on the box so it wouldn't get stopped by customs. And um, I actually one time carried a copy of Satanic Verses by Solomon Rushdie when it was banned in many places in the world. Uh, I actually wrapped it as a baby gift and took it with me um, to Singapore. Uh, so I know that strategy works pretty well. <laughs> but, but all in the name of, of, of public health, right? All in the name of, of, of trying to uh, advance the field in the U.S. where we're, we're a little too self-satisfied, we're a little too provincial, we're a little too willing to accept things as they are and not willing to challenge the convention. And, and you know, as I've taken care of vulnerable populations, I just felt like, well, 
you need more tools. Let's figure out what, you know, how to get more tools. And, and I ended up being an agent for doing that because Mike said, well, what would it take? And I told him and he, he didn't know it was going to be as long or as expensive as it turned out to be. But, uh, and, and all along the way, there were lots and lots of roadblocks. Um, but what I was able to do, I think that other people uh, haven't done before, was that I was able to call up every friendship and every relationship that I could think of that could help me with this quest. So when I needed to work on the microbiology of it, I got my friend Jason Tanzer from the University of Connecticut. When I needed a pharmacologist to help me with some of the safety calculations, I got uh, Gene Watson, who's a pharmacologist dentist at the University of Rochester. And it just grew like that. Every, you know, our, our regulatory guy, uh, Bill Cooley, um, Bill was a, a, was a PhD level chemist, was the head of regulatory affairs at Procter & Gamble for years. And Bill knew everybody in the field and, and, you know, so that as we needed to call up different resources, because we were doing everything just, you know, without any real major resources, we, were, we certainly weren't a drug company, and we didn't have millions of dollars to invest in something, and dentistry is such a small market in the first place. And I, in fact, I don't know if I mentioned, I, I when I first got my, my first experience with silver diamine fluoride, I, um, I went to some people in industry, in the dental industry, and I said, you guys sh should do this in the US. And they were all very thoughtful people and they came back to me and they said, there's no market. And I, you know, my response was, that's what they told me with fluoride varnish. You know, there's no market. I said, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I work in this field and I can tell you that there's plenty of opportunity to use these products. But because so much is focused on cosmetics in the US and so focused on, on the you know top 15 or 20% of the population that has a lot of money and who today doesn't even have any tooth decay, of course you wouldn't know about any of these things or be interested in doing anything about it. You know, you wouldn't see a market if, if you're into bleaching. You know, if you're into sparkles and toothpaste and other stuff like that, you know, that, that, that are not really fundamental. And, and, you know, where I was at was I was taking care of people who had serious problems, you know. And, and you know, I was in a situation where, where I was working with dentists who were overwhelmed with the amount that they needed to do. And, and they felt they weren't successful. You know, that had all these kids all going to the operating room and, and six, six months later, and, and you know, I, I worked with a pediatric anesthesiologist who thought it was just immoral that she was saying, seeing the same kids at Children's Hospital over and over again. It was as if they had a credit card for the operating room. And, and she was saying, you know, can't somebody stop this? You know, they started coming to me, those people started coming to me when I was working with Xylitol because, you know, they were desperate. There must be something here that's, that's you know, simple and cheap and, 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 and could be used to solve this problem. And these people who were, who were kind of peripheral to the core of dentistry were looking at this problem and saying, it's just plain immoral to allow this to go on. And, and yet... You know, we were fat and sassy. We had a great, we had a great deal. You know, we were doing what we were doing, but but we weren't looking forward. We weren't thinking about what, you know, what to, you know. There were so many people who back in the '60s said, you know, well, the dental caries problem in the United States, it's all over, right? There isn't a problem here anymore. But there wasn't, you know, they didn't consider immigration. They didn't consider the increasing amounts of sugar sweetened beverages in our diet. Um, they, they didn't consider the, all the income inequality that existed. Um, you know, they just were short-sighted, I think. How am I doing on answering your questions? Marvelous. Okay, anything else you want me to say? 
Yeah, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the um, classification of silver diamine chloride as a fluoride. Okay. You know, I believe the FDA has an opinion, and we have a couple of dental boards that have come down. And, yeah. and this is going to have some impact on the workforce utilization of the product, and I'm wondering if you have some comments about that. Well, so, um, first of all, uh, fluoride products in the U.S. Are, they have this sort of bifurcated regulatory status. So toothpaste is considered a drug in the United States. Most countries it's a cosmetic. Um, but because it has fluoride in it and because there are standards for toothpaste, um, it's a drug. Topical fluorides ended up being called medical devices, but in a very tricky way because they were labeled as cavity liners or as um, uh, hypersensitivity agents. And so when fluoride varnish first came in, it was, it, it was put in the device category because indeed it was good for sensitivity and it could be used as a cavity liner. And that was the cheapest way for industry to get it approved because the difference in cost was orders of magnitude different uh, for drugs than it was for devices. So as we approached uh, silver diamond fluoride, we went the route of saying, okay, uh, it's a medical device for hypersensitivity. Be and we set up a small business in order to um, get research funds to be able to do the studies that were required. So we did some pharmacokinetics and some simple, we did a couple of clinical trials on hypersensitivity in adults and so on because those are the things that the FDA required. We had to pay for animal studies, animal feeding studies, and other things that are required for these things. But, but we stayed with the device side uh, in part because small businesses don't pay any fees or very, very low fees to the FDA for approval. Um, the, the law says that the that, uh, FDA is supposed to recover the costs of all this regulation. So you go on the drug side as a drug company, and it, the fee for applying um, to get a new drug is about $999,000. And then if the FDA requires clinical trials, which it always does, every clinical trial you submit costs another million dollars to review. And of course, when a drug company does a study like this, it costs multi-million dollars to do because they don't do it the way ordinary people like us would do it, where we do it on, you know, with our friends and the back of an envelope and, and a lot of volunteers and all that kind of stuff. So you know, we had to choose that route. Now, the first day I went to see the head of devices, dental devices at the FDA, I said, I want you to know that I'm gonna be back. Because we had gotten a, an opinion from the, what's called the Office of Combination Products which decides if you're a device or a drug, we had gotten a written opinion that it was a device. And we felt really good about that because they won't even entertain regulating as a device if you don't get a uh, designation. So, but I said, because the person who's the head of, of dental devices at the FDA is a, a public health clinician and does volunteer work in third world countries and uh, you know had been quick to adopt fluoride varnish when it became available. Uh, I said, I'm gonna be back here because I know that I'm not supposed to advertise this for caries, I'm not supposed to, you know, I mean, it's for hypersensitivity and there are all these regulations that we're bound up by. But I want you to know I'm coming back. And I kept my word. The only problem was it took me seven years to get the initial approval, the initial clearance for the device um, and, and during that period, uh, there was some new management in the device part of the FDA and they tried to reverse the designation and turn it into a drug. And we had to use the brute force method in order to get uh, the device people to finally uh, sign off on it, to clear it. But meanwhile, I was getting ready to go back. And so we actually um, now have what's called an investigational drug permit, an IND it's called in FDA language, for silver diamine fluoride for caries arrest. And uh, we're now in the process of carrying out um, a safety study with children, uh, which has never been done before, 
to demonstrate to the FDA that nobody throws up after you put this on, that nobody ends up in the hospital and all those kind of things. And then with our colleagues from Hong Kong, we've assembled all the raw data from the previous studies. And under US law now, the FDA is required to accept that data. They don't have to, they don't have to agree with us about our interpretation of it, but they have to evaluate it. And so the stage we're at right now for a carries arrest indication as a drug is um, that we're doing the safety study that's going on right now. And we've assembled all of the data. And when the safety study is over, hopefully by the end of May, uh, we will go back to the FDA and we will say, we want approval to be able to use this for carries arrest. We want to be able to label it properly. We want to be able to advertise that it's be, you know, I want to be able to go to a professional meeting and give a speech and say, uh, this is what I do and this is what it's for. And, and without any question about the legality of that. At the same time, um, I've gone back to the FDA device people and said, well, there are two clinical trials that show you can use this instead of sealants. And even after 55, 60 years since sealants were invented, most dentists don't use them. And only about 40% of the children in the United States get them. So I don't call that a successful policy. And I see all kinds of problems with sealants in terms of their technique sensitivity, the fact that they don't adhere in a wet environment and that, that, that um, you can, they can leak, you can get dental caries developing under them and, and so on. So I think, well, you know, this is a kind of bonehead technology. It might've been really good for 1960, but can't we do any better than that? Plus, because it's technique sensitive, it requires a highly trained person to do. So here we have silver diamine fluoride. You paint it on, a, on an intact molar or even a molar that's got some beginning tooth decay in the walls of the fissures and it stops it. And it costs almost nothing to do and doesn't require a highly trained person to do. I mean, the worst mistake you can make is you put it on a tooth that has some tooth decay in it and you stop the tooth decay. <laughs> so you don't have a problem with diagnosis and it doesn't stain. So, you know, there's no discoloration, uh, you know. I mean, the discoloration is a good thing in a sense because w what it means is that when you put it on, you know it's working and parents know it's working. Um, you know, so, so people don't really react negatively at all to the discoloration. Um, dentists create those kind of problems by, by, you know, making it seem like it's something bad. Whereas from my point of view, it's actually good because I can, I know it's working and I know that that's what parents tell me and you know, when my adult patients tell me, okay, I get it, you know, uh, we're stopping this and it stop, you know, arrested tooth decay turns dark. So that's good. We have an indication that it's working. But, but anyway, so um, we've gone back to the Office of Combination Products um, and we've requested a designation uh, for the starting of a new indication for sealants. And that, that's a pretty big deal because we've got all these mechanisms in place in the United States to promote the use of sealants. And there's a lot of pushback. And until the FDA, you know, because people are vested in these programs and they have, you know, Medicaid has these rules where they expect organizations that provide dental care, you know, to get a certain level of sealants placed. And, and of course, what happens is they then place them on the low hanging fruit. The kids who get sealants are the ones who don't need them and the ones who really need them don't get them. And, you know, so if we had a simpler technology, a cheaper technology, um, you know, that wasn't so technique sensitive, it seems like you could probably then extend who does it and you could get it done to more, more kids and you get the right kids. Uh, and, and, you know, get away from this idea that we, you know, you have to do a filling in order to solve this problem. Because as far as I'm concerned, sealants are just fillings. And um, we've got, again, we've had our friends at the University of Hong Kong helping us and, you know, doing some of the CAT scans and other things we needed in order to convince the FDA. And surprising, I mean, there's really interesting literature that shows that if you put um, silver diamine fluoride on, a, on an intact molar, you get silver in the physically blocking the grooves. 
and there's somebody who's done some, some in vitro work that shows that it doesn't wash off. That's a logical question, you know? And, and um, you know, it's not a chemical reaction per se, so it still qualifies as a device. And, and you know, because and because everything you do that makes the regulation more complicated raises the cost. It eventually, and it slows everything down. It slows it down tremendously. So that's kind of where we are, you know? Well, it seems like we're in some really exciting new territory. I think so. In the future. I think so. You mentioned that uh, dentistry seems to be focused on a small segment of the population that really doesn't have caries. Yeah. And then there's this group that has a lot of disease that doesn't have access and doesn't have the right tools. And so could you speak for a moment to the people that are going to derive the most benefit from well, these new tools? Well, you know, I mean, the, the, the most obvious group in the United States um, are, are, are our most vulnerable populations, and that's um, the elderly. That's people who are physically and uh, cognitively impaired, disabled populations. I mean, these are the populations that right now just lose their teeth. Um, treatment for, you know, for most elderly people, treatment, if they, unless they're rich, treatment is uh, tooth extractions. Treatment in, in nursing homes is tooth extractions, always. And, and, you know, we've developed a little industry to do that, but, it, but it's not a very positive industry at all. And, um, you know, lots of autistic adults have lost many teeth because their treatment is basically always in the operating room and it's almost always extractions, you know. And, and even if they have fillings, they fail because their oral hygiene isn't very good and oftentimes they get diets that are, that are soft intentionally or full of sugar intentionally as a kind of behavior management tool. And, and so those are the populations, you know, I think if, if one tries to think about sort of like the biggest proportion of the whole public, of our whole community that's in need, it's that population more than any other population. The, the vulnerable kids are clearly, um, a critical population because the what we've done is we've rationed dental care for kids so uh, a very small proportion of the kids get uh, this operating room treatment where a few of their brain cells are killed every time they go they it's a revolving door they have it lots of families have this happening repeatedly it doesn't stop anything but what it does is it sucks up tons and tons of resources so all the money's all going for a relatively small number of children because the capacity of the system to put all the children in the hospital isn't there. And, 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 and what a travesty it would be to build the capacity to put every child in the hospital. I mean, might as well build iron lungs, you know? I mean, it's sort of like, like this, is, this is crazy, this approach. And, and, you know, people justify it because they say, well, you know, you put a child in the hospital, their quality of life goes up after you do that, they don't cry at night, their parents aren't bothered by, by all these kind of things, and, you know. But it's such short-term thinking, and it's so unfair, because it's only a tiny proportion of all children who have access to that care. So, I mean, it, it, you know, if it was a universal, that would be one thing, but, but it's not universal. And so most of the kids get nothing. And then even the kids, in many places, who are on waiting lists to go to the operating room, they get nothing. And we per per perpetuate this fraud that says that the surgery in the operating room solves the problem. So of course you wouldn't do anything before the kid went to the operating room because the solution is the operating room. And, and, and of course it looks very reasonable to parents because the kid's better off after you, after you do that. They're no longer crying or bothered, they can eat. And, and they don't keep dad up at night crying and, and it, it looks like a marvelous treatment. But it's a fraud because they don't reveal to you that it doesn't work. You know, I mean, what happened to informed consent? It's a fraud. So the first child that goes back for a return visit should tell us that there's something wrong with that belief system. Well, when you get 30, 40, 50% of children being sick again in a year, what, what medical procedure would be allowed if, if the truth be known, you know? I mean, if, you, if, if any procedure failed at a 50% rate, and especially one that's not a, a life-threatening, for, for a life-threatening disease, I mean, nobody would allow that treatment. So we've been able to convince people 
that what we're doing is right when it's not right. It's not moral, it's not a good use of money, it, it creates more inequity, because the do-gooders, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's true in all aspects of public health. You know, the idea that you're gonna lift all the boats just doesn't turn out to be true. You create opportunities for people to get treatment, like you get Head Start referrals or you get whatever, and it's the kids who are better off. There's a gradient. It's the parents who are more able. It's the, the, the families that have other resources. And those are the kids who get these treatments. And the kids who don't have, don't have that kind of social support, that kind of infrastructure around them, don't get those treatments. So we perpetuate the problem. We make, actually make it worse. And, and you know, it's not for lack of, of, of good, you know, good intention. It's not that at all. But it's a narrow, short-sighted kind of approach to the problem. Perhaps I could take a little distraction now and talk about sugar, okay. because there are so many uh, people that believe that caries is exclusively a disease of sugar, and that is all we really need to do is tax sugar or control sugar or replace sugar, and they take that approach. Mm -hmm. And and so, could you speak to that issue and, and well, how it maybe interfaces with? What's going on? With yeah, our I mean, it's it, it's pretty clear that um, for most complicated problems like this, you need a multifaceted approach to solving the problem. That one, I mean, fluoride toothpaste would solve this problem. If we could get everybody to use fluoride toothpaste and use it really regularly, we would we would reduce the problem dramatically. But it's hard to do, and certainly dentists aren't going to do it because dentists don't have enough contact with, with families or individuals to be able to change their behavior. And, um, you know, so, so of course that's why we think about, I guess the way I look at it is, is if a patient can do more, then I can do less. So if I can get you to not drink sugar-sweetened beverages, if I can get you to brush your teeth with Florida toothpaste, if I can get you to come regularly so that I can apply topical fluorides, there's a good chance I can probably control your disease. But if you can't do all those things, then I need to do more. And the way I look at it is, okay, what's, what's more, given that I don't have unlimited contact time with a family? So that's where I start out by saying, well, okay, if I can use a form of topical fluoride or an antimicrobial, um, then, then I'd like to do that because that doesn't require such high levels of contact, uh, so much professional time. And if I can make it simpler technology and it can be done by paraprofessionals, or it can be done by lay people, that's even better. But that's not to say that, that um, the problem of sugar-sweetened beverages isn't a huge problem. And it is, in the US, it's a problem of sugar-sweetened beverages. It's not a problem of sugar in general. Um, that's the major source of all the extra calories. That's why the children get fat. And, and in theory, if you took away the extra calories that most of these kids are getting, um, they probably wouldn't get tooth decay either. Um, so we're actually um, planning a, a randomized trial where um, what we're gonna do is counsel parents whose children are going to the operating room about how they can assume their role uh, as parents in charge of a child's diet. So I, I had this clinical experience a little boy came to me and he had bad tooth decay. And I, it was in the morning and I asked him what he'd had for breakfast. And he told me that he'd had two Cokes or three Cokes and it, was, it wasn't even 11 o'clock in the morning. And so I asked his father, I said, well, so who bought this Coke? Well, of course, the family bought it. And, and I said, well, why is it in the refrigerator? You know it's not good for your kid, right? And he agreed with me that it wasn't good for his kid. And he said, well, that's what he wants. And, and so that's a fundamental parenting problem, is that, that if you're a parent and you don't understand that it's your job to pick what the kids eat and it's the kid's job to eat it, you're gonna fail at controlling tooth decay. And so our strategy is in fact to, um, to counsel parents whose kids now are in the operating room, so you have a kind of a sentinel event, a big deal, um, about how to assume this role of being in charge of the diet and also of modeling for their own children, as 
demonstrating by doing um, that, that sugar-sweetened beverages are not the solution. And um, the idea behind this is to home deliver to the families um, during this sort of critical period when you're trying to change things after the operating room, um, water bottles uh, full of fluoridated water that will fill their refrigerator. And we have a partner in doing this that um, makes uh, cute, brightly colored, animal-shaped water bottles, because we're primarily talking about preschoolers. Uh, and, and so we're in the process of designing a study like this. So it's, it turns out that, that some investigators at um, Children's Hospital in Boston did this with obese uh, Hispanic teenagers. And of course they didn't use water bottles, um, but they did substitute um, non-sugar sweetened beverages. And they delivered them to the house and they filled the refrigerator with them and lo and behold the kids lost weight. And I'm sure they, their teeth were healthier too, but they didn't study that. And there have been a couple of other studies, uh, one in, in Holland where they did this similar kind of thing. And again, they got positive results. And, and so, you know, the problem with nutrition and dentistry and sugar and dentistry is that, they did, that what's written and what's done hasn't changed in 25 or 30 years. There's nothing clever, there's nothing new. I mean, sure, talk about soda taxes and stuff like that, I mean, that's fine. It, you know, it's not a bad idea, just like we tax cigarettes and cigarette consumption goes down. It's not a bad idea at all. But it's, a, it's only one piece of the puzzle, and it's a hard piece to accomplish. And so, you know, I'm not willing to wait until all these other things get done to try to do something about the problem. And so I just think, well, okay. Again, if, if the family can't do as much, I try to do more. You know, so more doesn't mean just fillings or just the, the, the stuff I learned in school. It means let's use everything we possibly know. That's why we develop xylitol products, you know, again, to try to find solutions that we could, you know, we could, we, people could try out and, 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 and maybe make work. And, uh, could you mention a little bit about the Betadine story as well? Sure. How it interfaces with these tool, this toolkit. Well, again, you know, uh, going back into the 1960s uh, or even the 50s, there was a huge effort to screen various antiseptics uh, against tooth decay. Because, of course, we knew already, certainly in the 50s, we knew that you could make a vaccine against tooth decay. You know, it was a bacterial problem, and, and you know, you could kill bacteria, you could use penicillin, and you could kill these alpha hemolytic strep. And, and lo and behold, you'd get less tooth decay. But, but of course, to make a vaccine, there are other, there's a, a lot of public health considerations. And, and to make a vaccine with potential side effects for a disease that wasn't considered to be life-threatening um, was a real problem. And so all these years, people have made vaccines and they know they could make them work, but they never ever make it into the armamentarium. But so at the same time, there was a lot of effort to screen topical agents. And the, of course, the toothpaste manufacturers in particular were looking for ways to uh, augment their, their, their consumer product because the big money's in the consumer products. And so, you know, you had, for example, Colgate adding xylitol as an antimicrobial to toothpaste uh, and doing clinical trials outside the United States, um, you know, that suggested that they might be able to make this work. It went on the market in, in Scandinavia for a little while and then disappeared. And clearly, they couldn't make whatever their bottom line was on it, and so they didn't, they didn't continue that. But, but I went back and I, and I realized that there had been a, a pretty big effort uh, among the, the, the cariologists that work with rats to screen various kinds of antiseptics. And there had even been some very, very early um, uh, studies with the potassium iodide and, and, and uh, povidone iodine um, where they either were trying to prevent maternal transmission of oral bacteria from mother to child uh, or they were, they were trying to arrest tooth decay. And they were on the right track, um, but they did some small studies. And of course, in those days, they weren't regulated by the FDA or any of that. I mean, there wasn't any hoopla about this in those days. They just did it. And they would do it on dental students or they would do it on each other. 
And, um, and there were positive results, but not good enough to, to spur these people on. And, and, and also because they weren't, they didn't have, they, as researchers, they didn't see the big picture. They didn't see how you get this to market, you know, what the vehicles are, what's the mechanism, you know, and of course that's pre-Medicaid. So there wasn't any money to pay for care for, for poor people, uh, for vulnerable children. Um, you know, so it wasn't at all clear where this was all going. Um, but yet they, they knew that there were potent antiseptics uh, and particularly iodine. Potassium iodine had been used as disclosing solutions since the 1950s. So dentists had, were familiar with potassium iodide. Uh, and it was already something that they were using. So it wasn't a very big jump then to say, well, okay, let's see if we can control tooth decay bacteria with this. And of course they did, but they couldn't, they couldn't go anywhere with it. It just went, stopped. And, and, and then in the 60s or 70s, I guess already, you had um, this group of people saying there isn't gonna be any more tooth decay in the United States. And at the National Institutes of Health, for example, they changed their focus to periodontal disease. And they said everybody had periodontal disease. This was an incredible joke. Everybody had periodontal disease. They were saying, you know, there were papers that were written that said that half of all teenagers had periodontal disease. I mean, it was absurd. And I mean, absurd for any clinician. Uh, and, and yet, there was all this attention turned to periodontal disease and, and, and caries, we didn't train any people. There were no cariologists trained in the United States during that period. And we, went, we lost a whole generation of people um, who, who could have worked on this problem and it could have helped solve it. Um, and so, so, you know, part of what I was doing was going backwards and saying, well, let's look at what was done. And, and it turns out, luckily, that some of those people are still alive, still kicking, you know, some retired. But basically, you know, so I went back. You know, I went to, to Irwin Mandel at Columbia. I went to my friend Jason Tanzer at Connecticut. All these people at the end of their careers who had made all these contributions over time and, and said, help me. You know, I need to learn some of this science. I need to learn, you know, what I might be able to apply. And, and then my, my, my good friend, uh, Bob Berkowitz at Rochester, who'd been a graduate student back in the 70s and had worked on, on the use of betadine um, at Forsyth, um, where Percy Howe was, uh, he, had, he had this idea that he was gonna use betadine followed by fluoride varnish, because already we had breached the fluoride varnish era. And he'd done some work, he, very methodical guy, very intellectual, very, very smart, earnest, really earnest pediatric dentist who was taking kids to the operating room every day. And, you know, he showed that you could put betadine on teeth and you could keep the flora retarded on those teeth from growing back, you know, for, for months at a time. And he had the idea that he wanted to do a clinical trial where he was going to use betadine first and then he was going to use fluoride varnish. And at first I sort of poo-pooed that. But then I decided to try it. So I ended up doing two large cohort studies in Micronesia with very vulnerable children. And in both cases, this combination treatment worked really well. And in fact, my friend Tanzer said to me, well, you know, in medicine, they do a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, uh, and then the, the, the story of ulcers became clear. So, you know, we used to treat ulcers with salicylated, salicylated bismuth. Uh, uh, you know, things like Maalox that were, you know, treated the pain and coated the inside of the intestine. And then they came along, they discovered that it was caused by Helobacter. So they threw away all the Maalox and started with antibiotics. And today they treat it with both. And cancer drugs are that same way. They often, cancer drugs are synergistic. So by lowering the dose of each drug, they reduce the side effects and make it more palatable to get the treatment and they get better results. And it goes on like that. There's lots of, the treatment of nail fungus is, is done the same way. And, and so this was not such an unusual concept to use two different agents, one an antimicrobial and the other a, a fluoride for remineralization. But my contribution, you know, beside demonstrating overwhelmingly, you know, in a couple of vulnerable populations that this worked, and it worked much better than the fluoride varnish, was to say, well, okay, there's gonna be big barriers to getting dentists to do this because they're gonna to have to use two products and they're used to using only one. And, and it turns out that that's always hard. You know, 
It's really hard. And the other problem with it is that you can't make any money selling betadine. Okay? And so why would a company, and, and plus, of course, if you then went to the FDA and you said, I have a, I have a, a, a combination product here, two, two things in one, one package, this iodine and the fluoride varnish, all of a sudden that's a drug. So now you're talking about big money again and big studies. And I don't accept that approach. I said, well, we gotta come up with a different way of doing this. And so indeed, I mean, we ended up with a drug, but we constructed a fluoride varnish that contained betadine or povidone iodine. Not so easy chemically to actually do. It's really obvious that anybody who's ever used betadine knows that it's in water and fluoride varnish is in alcohol. And, it, and of course, if you put water in fluoride varnish, it sets. <laughs> So you can't just take betadine and add it to fluoride varnish. Uh, you have to you have to uh, do some interesting chemistry, and so we've done that. And in the lab, the, this new varnish um, uh, releases fluoride and releases iodine, and in the lab, it's active against tooth decay bacteria. So it's now it now has a IND from the FDA, an investigational drug permit. It's now uh, about to start phase one uh, safety studies. We'll be doing a um, pharmacokinetic study next to, to um, look at blood levels. It's not really necessary, but we're gonna do it for completeness sake. Um, I don't think any animal studies will ever be necessary because it, these products are really well known now at this point. Uh, and I've previously gotten an IND for fluoride varnish um, for a study that never got done, but, but I've been through the gauntlet of the FDA, so I know what they would say. Well, and This is really exciting. This cohort of tools yeah and so yeah if you were to you know jump forward 10 years and say that we were successful educating the profession educating the population of the availability and we're and you know we optimized the resources that are now in our hands how will things look in 10 years from the perspective of the profession and from the perspective of the population well you know, so one has to go to school on what happened with fluoride varnish. So fluoride varnish came in as a medical device. It couldn't be advertised for, for uh, caries. Um, there was a lot of resistance in the profession, especially among the pediatric dentists. Um, something new, something they weren't familiar with, something used off-label, you know, as if it was like, you know, snake oil. And, or, or poison, you know, dangerous. And um, it took... Uh, five years from the time fluoride varnish came into the United States for there to be a national billing code for it. Um, you know, we had we had some state-only codes and state Medicaid programs, but those were abolished under under HIPAA. And, um, and we've seen this very, very slow progression. I mean, the American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends fluoride varnish and it's part of their guidelines and everything. But this took a long, long time. So as we approached the, the silver diamond fluoride problem, we tried to go to school on that. And long before we had FDA approval, we started talking about what are gonna be the barriers to getting the profession to adopt this? And so within months of when we got FDA clearance, we were before the uh, billing code commission with a request for a carries arrest billing code and in order to get that what we had to do is we had to show them that it was being taught and that it was being used so how can I show them that something's being used that's illegal <laughs> okay and so in fact that's where Steve Duffin comes in <laughs> because there were thousands of children in Oregon receiving silver nitrate treatments. Now, I just happened to have access to a lot of that data. And there were hundreds of dentists doing that. So I could go, and it turned out that there were pediatric dentistry graduate programs teaching the use of that. Even though it wasn't out there, it was being done. And so we went to the commission and we said, it's being taught, it's being used. Before that commission meeting, 
either either I had gone to every member of the committee. There, there were 21 members of the committee. Either I had talked to every single one of those people or somebody else who was trusted had talked to them. I took care of like the, the national CMS Medicaid director. I, I talked to the pediatric dentistry representative. I talked to the endo representative. I needed every, because every specialty is represented on this commission, plus the insurers. So I had already talked to the Delta Dental people and a bunch of these other groups and, and, and then trusted people had talked to the others. Um, so that morning when I went to the commission meeting in Chicago, there were roughly 75 proposals for, for codes or code changes. And I sat there, I was, I don't know, like number 27 or 29 in the morning, you know. So I sat there and I listened as they turned every single code down. Okay, and I had been told by the staff that they never approved one of these things the first time you went there. And I got a 19 to 2 vote in favor. Wow. They were captured by the concept that you could change the way carries was being managed. It did not, it wasn't that hard to sell. So, so the point here is, okay, that, that you know, you, you're not supposed to advertise this because it's not indicated for for carries, you um, you know you don't have any way to bill for it. You know, I mean, the dentists in the country are going to expect to get paid. Um, so we started trying to knock down the barriers. Think about this in terms of the, the way that that things get disseminated. How can you speed it all up? Well, so obviously one way was to get the get the billing code. A second way to to speed up dissemination was to get opinion leaders in dentistry to speak up. And, and so not long after it got cleared by the FDA, there was an article in um, dental, uh, there was one in Dental Hygiene Dimensions, there was one in the new uh, slick dentist magazine called uh, Decisions, it was the lead, lead article in Decisions. Um, it appeared in Compendium and these are not scholarly journals, these are the places that dentists go for information. Um, and then we... Don't forget about the cover of the California Dental Association. Well, right, so the next thing, <laughs> uh, but of course, Duffin had already led the way by getting, getting <laughs> silver nitrate in there. Uh, but of course, California was important because California had, had um, been behind Canberra and, and you know, risk assessment. And, and of course, the article that was written in Decisions was written by John Featherstone. And then the one in California Dental Association was written by Jeremy Horst, who's also at UCSF. These are people who, um, you know, were involved in the caries game, who knew that this was a big problem. Jeremy's a pediatric dentist, sees kids with cancer and all these other kinds of problems, you know, had an immediate application for, for these things. And, and, you know, so those opinion leaders were already starting to have an influence. And then, and then on top of that, we got other uh, people who were sort of on the speaking circuit, like Joel Berg and other other people like that, um, to try it clinically, to learn about it, um, you know, and make independent judgments for themselves about whether or not this was something that they um, wanted to try to let people know about. And so, over time, all of a sudden, you have a lot of opinion leaders talking about this. Um, Tim Wright, the, the former chairman of pediatric dentistry at the University of North Carolina, has given a number of continuing education classes now. Uh, and a, one that I attended, um, the dental director for the state Medicaid program was in the audience. So it wasn't long after that that he said, well, what, what do I do about this? You know, and, and, and so um, uh, Jeff Chafin, who is the vice president for dental affairs, uh, at uh, Iowa Delta, uh, Fred uh, Eichmiller, who's the vice president for dental affairs at Wisconsin Delta. All of a sudden you have people getting involved uh, and those opinion leaders influence what happens. And so all of a sudden now you have a growing insurance coverage for this. Washington DC Medicaid covers it. Oregon Medicaid is now just about, I think has already finished its regulations to cover it. Um, you know, you're gonna, you start to see there's gonna be a, um, a symposium 
at the next uh, meeting of all the Medicaid directors, the national meeting, which is in Washington, D.C. in June, and there's going to be a symposium, and Jeremy Horst is going to present the evidence for this at, in front of all the Medicaid directors. Um, you know, so all of a sudden you get this snowball happening, which didn't happen with fluoride varnish. Um, in, in fact, what's interesting is it didn't happen with high-speed hand pieces. It, it didn't ha uh, sort of happened with composite fillings. But if you actually look at the history of composite fillings, they go way, way back. You know, I mean, there were lots of tries to make materials that would work, but it took a long, long time for these things to be adopted. And, and so the idea is we know that in dentistry, nobody will try anything new until the people they respect try it. That's the way people in dentistry learn. We don't have um, hospital, you know, I mean, in a hospital, you have a formulary, you have formal mechanisms to change things. With dentists, mostly practicing still in very small groups, it's very hard to get to them. So I, I've been trying to figure out what to do, you know, and I'm, so I'm sort of picking at the edges of this problem of continually lowering the barriers to people adopting this. I mean, one of the reasons that, that I wanted the horse paper to be published was because it had a protocol in it. I said, this is how you do it, because those of us who had been doing it, we didn't think this was any big deal, and, and you know, we were just doing it, you know, but we didn't know how long should you leave it on? You know, should you put it on twice or should you put it on once? I mean, there are lots of unanswered questions about this stuff. And, and I mean, one of the things that's happening right now, for example, is that, that uh, a blue color is being added to the, to the silver fluoride, in the Elevate product, so that um, you can see where you're putting it. Because I think that one of the reasons sometimes you get teeth that don't seem to arrest is maybe you're not getting any on there. Right. And you don't know, because you, you know. And if you slop it all over the place, obviously that's not good. So besides, it's a waste of money. Uh, and and so, so, you know, what we needed to do was to get a protocol. Um, I mean, Jeremy's article has a consent form in it. It was obviously designed for dental schools and is a little bit too complicated and too, too elaborate. But the, the idea behind it is right. And that is people need to know how to do this. You can't assume that they know what people like I know, where, where you know, I had all these years of using it, I have a pretty good sense of what's required, but not a scientific sense, not a, not, you know, it's impossible. You're never gonna get studies that study uh, all these detailed clinical things, should you use a big microbrush or a little microbrush. Nobody's going to do a study like that, uh, you know. So, so we're going to we're going to just have to, by trial and error, adopt some methods. And so, by trying to get that down on paper, that helps everybody. You know, how do I train my dental assistant to do this? You know, I don't want my dental assistant doing something wrong. That opens me to criticism. So, so I'm going to hold back until somebody helps me figure those things out. And so, you know, I just went over and did a a talk for the Yakima Valley Farm Workers, which is the largest Hispanic serving uh, dental program in the country. And I had all the chiefs of all their dental clinics there and we going over all these details because they have uh, both general practice and pediatric residents working for them. They have to be able to train them. They need to know what to do. And, and you know, so it's all these little details and that's where lots of people are gonna contribute. You know, people, you know, what I always tell clinicians is, is do this stuff and, and write up case studies and share your information because academic people are not going to do all these pieces. And certainly industry is not going to do it. They have no incentive to do it. So, so you know, as long as they're selling stuff, they don't care. You know, it's a little callous, but, but that's kind of the reality. Well, after 35 years of being a dentist, I can tell you that I'm more excited right now about being a dentist and about the yeah. future than I have at any time in the past. And, uh, and so thank you for giving me that gift. And, uh, <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, I hope that this message will help disseminate the story. Okay. I Thank hope, you, Peter. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I hope that's what you wanted. Well done. No, you're welcome. It's easy to talk about because it's just Thank you so much. It's it's just the truth. It is the truth. It's so nice to be able.